Welcome everybody this evening to the annual Alec Roger Memorial Lecture here at Birkbeck. I'm Jeff Walters, I'm Dean of the School of Business, Economics and Informatics and it's my pleasure to welcome you all, staff, students, alumni and guests to this evening's lecture hosted by the Department of Organisational Psychology. A very special welcome as well this evening to um, our guest speaker, Professor Rob Breener, Professor of Organisational Psychology from Queen Mary University of London. It's a special welcome back to Birkbeck for Rob, as you probably all know he was here for um, 20 years I think before leaving for Bath in, in 2011. Um, during his time at Birkbeck Rob served as director of the PhD programme, director of research and head of school. I'm also personally delighted to be welcoming Rob back. You probably can't remember, but he was on my interview panel um, for, this, for my job back in 2007. So my being here is in part down to him, to which I'm, I'm grateful for. Although I was told afterwards there were only three applicants for the job, two of which, two of which were not shortlisted. So um, having, having sat on numerous recruitment panels over the past few years, I know that it's a much more competitive environment now um, in academia. Rob's presentation this evening is entitled Evidence-Based Practice is Easy to Understand, so why is it so difficult to do? And he's going to set out the basic premise of evidence-based practice and also explore the obstacles and barriers to this approach. So in preparing for tonight, this talk made me think about the role of evidence in, in leadership. Now, I've not studied leadership, so I'm not professing to be an expert. We have a room, of, room full of experts here tonight. But I do believe that we've seen in recent years an emphasis by many business and political leaders who put their success down to their instincts and intuition, perhaps, rather than an understanding and appreciation of data and evidence. And I think this feeds into the self-belief and self-promoting narratives that we, that we see um, from some individuals as some sort of visionary. More often than not, these leaders happen to be men um, and feeds into arrogance and overconfidence. And I think these are traits that are often mistaken for good leadership and explains in the words of, and I hope I'm pronouncing this name right, Thomas Chamorro Pramusic, why so many incompetent men become leaders. So I think there's arguably a place for intuition, but intuition backed up by experience. And I don't believe that this alone can replace the need for good evidence to support decision making. So I think tonight is, is the right moment to re-emphasize this need for evidence-based practice, particularly when thinking about leadership. And I look forward to listening to Rob's discussion. Before I hand over to Rob, please just allow me to say a few more words to introduce this lecture for those of you that are attending for the first time. The Alec Roger Lecture Series has been a long-standing commitment within the Department of Organisational Psychology. It was first initiated in 1983 to one of the achievements of Alec Roger, one of the founding members of the department. After completing a degree in psychology at Cambridge, Alec Roger joined the National Institute of Industrial Psychology in London and became head of its vocational guidance department. During World War II, he worked in the War Office and then in the Admiralty. Following the Second World War, he joined Birkbeck as a reader in psychology in 1948 and was made Professor of Occupational Psychology in 1960 until his retirement in 1975. He was one of the founders of the Department of Organisational Psychology at Birkbeck in 1962 and he developed both undergraduate and postgraduate courses in occupational psychology during his time at Birkbeck. The department today and my colleagues within maintain their commitment to excellence in research and teaching as we seek to understand the changing and challenging nature of organisations and the implications of people working within them. The lecture series began in 1983, a year after Alec Rogers' death, and we've been privileged over the past 39 years to welcome many distinguished individuals who've had a, a demonstrable impact on organisations in academia, public service and industry. Professor Rob Breener is therefore the latest in a long line of distinguished, speech, distinguished speakers and I'm delighted to welcome him and you all to this evening's memorial lecture. I'm sure there'll be a lot we can take away from tonight's presentation. So, without further ado, I will pass you over to Rob. It's lovely to see you back at Birkbeck. I hope you all have an enjoyable evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Jeff, and thank you very much to the department for inviting me. Thank you, all of you, for coming out tonight as well. I know there's lots of other exciting things going on, things like Wimbledon, 
other kinds of stuff that I know some of you will be looking at your phones throughout. Uh, and Alex has said, is there any important update? She's going to let me know. So for those of you who are fans, then uh, yes, I, I can provide you with an update. Okay, so I've got about 45 minutes to talk, and I'm quite happy to take questions as we go along. In preparing this talk, I guess I was really concerned to talk about some of the barriers, as Jeff mentioned, to doing evidence-based practice in fields like HR and management and organisational psychology. And in preparing it, I actually thought a lot of those barriers come from us. And by us, I mean people who are interested in evidence-based practice and try and promote it in HR, management, organisational psychology. And I think historically, I've always tended to see them, as in the practitioners, as having a problem that I, or we, maybe more as academic students, could help them with. And now I think that's completely wrong. Completely wrong. Uh, I think we are one of the, and by we I mean people who promote it, we are one of the sources of important barriers to stop people from doing it. So I'm going to spend quite a lot of time uh, on that. I've narrowed it down to 18 mistakes I think we've made. <laughs> there were more, if that's the short list. Uh, so it's going to be a bit of, yeah, yeah. I'm going to own up to some things I think that are problematic. So once upon a time, once upon a time, let's cast your mind back. I don't know how far. Any of you recognise any of these songs? <laughs> any of you remember any of them? Can you guess what year this is? I think so. Early 2000s. Yeah, no, Jeff got 98. And this is some of the things that happened. Uh, Millennium Dome, now the O2 construction began. Rolls Royce was acquired by BMW. Good Friday agreement was signed, still in the news, of course. Um, DVD format released uh, onto the UK market. <laughs> Harry Potter and Chamber of Secrets. And in January in 1998, January 1998, in Eastbourne, do you know where Eastbourne is, just in case you don't? <laughs> there, it's a really nice seaside place. In January, in Eastbourne, I was presenting a paper at the Division of Occupational Psychology annual conference. Uh, and yeah, there's a title, What is an Evidence-Based Approach to Practice and Why Do We Need One in Occupational Psychology? Now, again, hist historians may be interested in looking at this. There's a number of things about it. First... <laughs> is the, I mean, the interesting anomaly between I'm saying this is about occupational psychology, but even then we we're a department of organisational psychology, so you're an occupational, organisational, occupational, organisational kind of division. What else do you notice about this that gives you clues about the history, about how old it is? The phone numbers. The phone numbers are pretty not, they're, they're old-fashioned, and, and also a fax machine. Fax machine <laughs> number, yeah. And also you can see here, this is Times New Roman, uh, and it was really big. In the late 90s, and for quite a while, people have gone more to sans serif type fonts now, but it was really, really big then, particularly laser printers just kind of very exciting to do things in time to Rome. So I presented this paper. Why did I do it? Because I'd become very surprised and naively shocked, I guess, about the disconnect between what we've been teaching on master's programmes, both here and Sheffield I was before, and what our ex-students ended up doing. And that probably applies to some of you. So I would talk to ex-students who've been at Birkbeck or Sheffield, thinking, oh, they're going to be applying all the stuff we've taught them, all the science, or the... No, not really. They were doing other stuff. Okay, why is that? I also saw sort of what I understood to be the evidence about organisational practice and what organisations seem to be doing, and also the proliferation and popularity of what seemed to me to be quite dodgy stuff, including stuff done by academics. So I kind of thought, uh, because a friend of mine, a friend and colleague, Shirley Reynolds, who's a clinical psychologist, introduced me to the concept of evidence-based practice, and I thought, great, you know, maybe if... I introduce evidence-based practice to the occupational organisational psychology community, maybe it will change the way they worked. How wrong I was. How naive. But that's why I did it. I did it because I thought it will help with some of the, these kind of issues and problems. On getting a good dinner, or what is evidence-based practice? Over the years, I've had different kind of ways of describing the principles of evidence-based practice. This is my latest one I've been using for a couple of years. I know some of you in the room have heard it before. But imagine if you got this kind of WhatsApp message. You ever got a message like this? It's a fake one. You can actually do fake WhatsApp things on an app. It's quite fun. But basically, someone's, I'm meeting someone. Let's say it's Madrid. I'm going to be in this hotel. They're going to come pick me up in Madrid. They're paying for dinner. It's obviously not a university, because generally they don't. <laughs> let's say it's a big corporation. And they're saying, you can just book wherever you like for dinner. But, but wherever you like, it doesn't matter. Where, it's on us, fine. Great, happy to do that. I say, happy to do that. So imagine... And you may not have to imagine that you really, 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 really like food and eating and drinking, as I do, and you're going to try and choose a restaurant. Okay, so would you look 
This is an obvious question. Of course, you look for evidence and information to help you book a restaurant. It's a city you don't know, Madrid, for example. Would you use multiple sources of evidence or just one source? Multiple, like what? TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor, yeah. Ask the concierge. Ask the concierge, good. What else? Google. Google, yeah, but what Google's a search engine? What, I'm giving Google reviews? Social media, my husband. Social media, my husband. Can you Google him? Can you go yeah. So you'd use multiple sources of evidence, including maybe people, concierge, and so on. Now, do you think you're more like, less likely to get a good restaurant, a good dinner, if you think about the trustworthiness of the information you've got? Is it what a concierge tells you, reliable information about a good restaurant? Yeah. It does depend, yeah, that's right. It always depends. But why might it not be? Commission. Commission. Friends. Yeah, kickbacks. Con so, yeah, typical concierge. You do understand this. What about TripAdvisor? Is that reliable? No. 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 Might you look at it? You might can be. You might look at it. I was actually going to do TripAdvisor on the best restaurants near to here, but then, yeah, it was taking too long. Um, <laughs> Would you take a structured approach to gathering rather than an unstructured one? Would you maybe, you know, some people might even do like some have an Excel spreadsheet. Some people yes. might do that. And they might list the restaurants, look at the reviews, talk to your husband, etc., and start to write down which restaurants seem to be good. So you know, you've got a structured approach to it. So this is what you might do if you were really, really bothered about getting a good dinner. So are you more or less likely to get one if you, if you use some versus no evidence? Of course, if you use some are multiple sources versus one source. Obviously, multiple sources is better. Using information with an awareness of its trustworthiness versus using it without knowing that. Obviously, it's going to help to know that. And taking a structured approach will help. Now, most of us, I'm guessing, it may not be around a restaurant, it may not be about having dinner, but most of us probably, for important decisions, do something like that. The principles of evidence-based practice are pretty easy to understand, and that's kind of the case I'm trying to make today. They're easy to understand, but they seem quite hard to do in practice. So they are the key things. That's my restaurant, choosing a restaurant analogy. You can probably use other things, you know, to do other examples from yourself to do it. So what's been happening? These are roughly the dates when different fields of practice started to talk about evidence-based practice. It doesn't mean they did them. And in fact, in medicine, there's still some controversy about whether and the extent to which medicine is now evidence-based, even 30 plus years later, uh, because it's difficult to do Clinicians maybe don't do very much. If you ask NHS workers and other medical practitioners if they really do this, the answer is not much, maybe a bit. So still, even in a, even in a profession which has been doing for a long time, it maybe isn't happening much. But these are roughly the dates. You can see one thing all these professions have in common is they're all about people. They're all about welfare. They're all about well-being of different kinds, as indeed HR, management, and organisational psychology is as well. Uh, different fields have centres that have tried to promote evidence-based practice. So we have medicine, policy making, policing, uh, cons conservation, education. It's, and it's the same kind of thing in all those fields. They're trying to promote practitioners to help and support them to be more evidence-based in their practice. And in 2010, we set up the Centre for Evidence-Based Management to try and do for management what those other centres had kind of done in terms of providing training and support and other kinds of things. So there has been generally some activity around evidence-based practice, quite a lot in general, I'd say. What about management in particular? So the first kind of paper or presentation <laughs> that probably came out of it was 2005, is there such thing as evidence-based management from Denise Rousseau, it's probably the first attempt to do it. What's interesting about the Academy of Management, which is the main kind of professional body for management academics, is that every, almost every president gives the same keynote address, which is, we're a bunch of academics, we're doing research and management, and managers basically don't pay any attention to what we do at all. <laughs> a different versions of that, but it's the, same, it's the same kind of issue. So Denise framed it in terms of evidence-based management. Pfeffer and Sutton at Harvard Business Review had an article in 2006. Hard Facts, this is their book, probably the first book that came out around it. And even quite early on, there were some critiques of evidence-based management. So evidence-based management, the very idea or backlash against pluralism, etc. And then Gary Latham's book about having to be evidence-based manager. Concept, concept cleanup time. So pretty quickly we were saying, actually, this concept's getting a bit messy. How can we clean it up? I'm not sure how much we cleaned up, but we tried. Handbook of evidence-based management. And again, another critique of evidence-based management. Uh, another critique of evidence-based management. A summary of, I guess, what's been going on in the field, including controversies. Now, you, you may or may not think that it's a bit strange. Why is this controversial? It's quite interesting. I'll come back to that later. So if you use the example of me trying to get a good dinner, and you say that's evidence-based practice, why is that controversial? 
I'll come on to that later. But clearly, at least among academics, some academics find, yeah, there's lots of controversies around it. And the Centre of Evidence Based Management came out with this book in 2018. So that's sort of what's been happening in management. And when I was, again, researching for this uh, presentation, I also found that Scrum, you all know Scrum? What's Scrum? Is it nothing to do with rugby? But it's. Agile methodology. Thank you. Project Management Agile. And what's interesting about their website is they've actually trademarked evidence based management. <laughs> so apparently, I should probably be paying them some money or something, or. Yeah, so that, this is, they've trademarked evidence based management, and this is their model, which is nothing really like what, we, what I would mean by evidence based management, but there it is. Uh, and also on Amazon, I just found out this year you can actually buy a blank notebook. <laughs> and it says there's got evidence based management on it. So if you wanted to create your own model of evidence based management, buy the book and just write in it, you can, you can just have your own model of it. It's very interesting, yeah. Okay, what about HR in particular? What's been happening? So this is probably the earliest piece I can find happening to do by me about uh, evidence based in HR and. Corporate Research Forum got interested in it quite early on. That actually, Corporate Research Forum is doing another project right now about evidence-based HR. Uh, there's this journal, Startup Evidence-Based HR, which actually is more about publishing empirical findings, not about evidence-based practices as a whole. Uh, Katie Jacobs wrote this very good article in 2015 about it, so there's a bit of interest. KPMG started talking about it, but they more talk about data analytics rather than other kinds of evidence. Sage and some of the consultants mentioned it a kind of little bit. Uh, SHRM, which is the equivalent of CIPD in the States, they were interested for a very, very brief time in it and published this article and then never seemed to mention it again. <laughs> so, so I don't know why, but yeah. Uh, again, there been a little bit of research around practitioners using evidence or not. Uh, yeah, and SHRM's journal also published had a special issue about evidence-based HR. This is the CIPD profession map in 2013. And this is a profession map in... 2018, you can see that evidence base is one of the three core kind of ways in which it argues people that belong to CRPD should actually operate. So CRPD is quite explicit in kind of trying to adopt and use it, and they've got lots of resources on the website for it. There's not quite, I mean, yeah, th there's not equivalent professional bodies who've done that for HR or management, I would say. And of course, how could I not mention the professional doctorate at Birkbeck that started? And what's going to be weird about this talk and doing it here? is obviously the professional doctorate in uh, organisational psychology and professional doctorate in HRM here that are both run very much along evidence-based practice lines. So a lot of things we're going to say don't really apply to Birkbeck, but I would argue Birkbeck is the exception that proves the rule because there's not hundreds of courses on evidence-based management, evidence-based HR. There's very, very few. There's no other professional doctorates that I'm aware of in evidence-based HR. So, yeah, this is the culmination, I guess, of it. What's in general been happening? Well, there's a few books, there's some academic articles, not hundreds, but there's some, including lots of critiques. There's a handful of articles of business press. There's very few examples of interest from consultancies, which is also quite interesting. Why, why is there not more? And there's also not a shared understanding of what evidence-based practice means. Some focus a lot on science. So the early book, like the Pfeffer and Sutton, was very much about science. Science, science, scientific findings. That's what evidence base is. Other people focus more on organisational data analytics. Others do take, pay attention to multiple sources. So that's my sense of what's been happening, I guess, generally. So I've given you the uh, getting a good dinner example. What's the more official view uh, of what evidence based practice is? And as I go through this, I'd like to be, I'm sure you're very emotionally intelligent, is to reflect on how it's making you feel. How do you feel? If you think about your own practice and what you do, how can you read this or hear me talk? Do you feel good? Do you feel bad? Do you feel, what do you feel? Let me, let me know as we go through. Right. This is a formal definition which is used across multiple fields. It starts in medicine. The conscientious, explicit and judicious use of the best available evidence from multiple sources to increase the likelihood of a favourable outcome. You see, I've said that phrase and presented it hundreds of times and I don't like it anymore. Because it's a bit preachy, and it's telling someone to do something to be conscientious is a bit, really? You know, why are you telling me to be, con why isn't it? Con you know, and you can do this for anything. You can go to the market to buy food and be conscientious, explicit, and judicious. You can do anything. Because it's just very odd. Why is that there? But anyway, that is a form definition. In general, it's about a process. 
Uh, it's not about certainty. So you go through this process not to find the answer because there aren't answers, because we're not doing maths, we're not doing algebra, there isn't an answer. There's multiple potential sort of part answers. It's about probability and likelihood, and it's also, if anything, it's about reducing uncertainty. So given our context, doing this thing is more likely to get to the outcome we want than doing another thing or doing nothing. So that's the sort of definition. This is an infographic produced by CIPD in the Centre for Evidence Based Management. And the idea is, I'm going to make it bigger in a minute, you do it first to identify a problem opportunity. And if you find a problem opportunity, then you use the same kind of process to identify a possible solution or intervention. That's the kind of idea. Look, I can see, I can pick up some of your emotions already, because I'm very emotionally intelligent, and I see you thinking, what is this? What is this? Or maybe you're not, maybe you're not. So there's the four sources of evidence, so scientific literature, organisational data, what stakeholders think, and your own professional expertise as a practitioner. Jeff mentioned in his introduction the idea of using gut or intuition. And of course, gut and intuition is potentially a good source of evidence if it's valid and reliable, if it's based on experience, repeated experience. But often it isn't, because you couldn't have repeated experience of things leaders go through, or, yeah, or politicians go through. So it can be, but often it's not. There's a definition of that, and there's the six steps. You ask a question, you acquire the evidence, you critically praise it, you put it together, you apply it, and then you assess it. So back to getting a good dinner. My question is, what, what are the good restaurants in Madrid? I ask the question, I acquire the evidence. TripAdvisor, concierge, your husband, whatever. Acquire all the evidence. I critically appraise it. Is it good? I pull it together. I apply it. I book a restaurant and I say, is this, am I enjoying this dinner or not? It's just a process. That you, you know, the idea is you'll go through a series of steps to do it. So I think one way of understanding what evidence-based practice is, is to consider the difference between, I would say, what we already do, uh, I guess when people make decisions organisations do, my sense of that, and also you know, what the difference are with evidence-based practice. The first thing is this general approach. I mentioned I don't like some of these terms anymore, but conscious, explicit, judicious. Most important, I think, are explicit and judicious. You don't sort of say, I just know, I've just got this idea, I read this thing once, I've got this data in my head. And you have to be explicit, what is the evidence, data, information you're talking about? Make it explicit. The other important part of that is the judicious. So again, the idea of evidence-based practice is not that you get all the available evidence, throw it in a big bucket and use all of it. The idea is you focus on the best available evidence, because a lot of data, a lot of evidence is going to be unreliable. It's just noise. You don't want to use it. You want to get rid of that and look at stuff that's more reliable. Second difference, I think, is multiple sources. So again, I think people do use multiple sources sometimes, but uh, not always. But the idea is just to triangulate. Am I getting the same picture from different sources? Uh, and there's cross-check, but also, really importantly, and again, for people interested in science and scientific findings, it's so to contextualise data from other sources. So you might have some very good body of research about a particular phenomenon. Whether that body of research is relevant or applicable to you and your organisation depends completely not on how good the science is, but on getting evidence and data from other sources, from stakeholders, from organisational context. You can't just apply this stuff. You need a lot of information about the setting which are working, and also what's the problem or opportunity. Maybe it's completely different from what is being tackled in all this great research. So you can't just use research, and that's something I think is often kind of mistaken. Also, structure and stepped approach. So part is to get uh, evidence for possible problems of opportunities first, and then only consider evidence. Because we're e you should always start with the problem, and also easily distracted and pushed off course. Trying to follow evidence-based practice process is slow, it's tiring, it's boring, Lots of cognitive biases, lots of shiny, bright things, lots of shortcuts. It's hard to stick to it unless you have some sort of uh, system. So, here's an example. Now, uh, do you remember the uh, memo that Jacob Rees-Mogg <laughs> left for? If you don't, Jacob Rees-Mogg, I can't remember his official title, but he left a note uh, on, I know, some, I was in the Department of Education, the comment on their pin board saying, Sorry you haven't been at work. It's a very real classic passive-aggressive kind of fridge note. Who's been drinking my milk? Would you replace it? Kind of thing. Uh, so he put up this note because it's the idea that working from home could be a problem. And this has been a very big thing throughout the pandemic. So supposing you were working uh, in, a senior, uh, in a large organisation, the senior management team believes there's a problem with too much working from home. The vast youths look into it. These are examples of the kinds of questions you would ask in an organisation if you're trying to be evidence-based around this problem that's been presented to you. So I'm going to go through each area, each of those four areas, quickly and show you the kinds of questions. So firstly, you look at your own expertise as a practitioner. What do I think is going on? What do we think is going on? What, what is our view? What is our experience? 
Maybe you've got a lot of experience, maybe you've got none, maybe it's really trustworthy, maybe it's not. But what is it, you and your team? If you think there is a problem opportunity, then what about solutions? What do you know about solutions? What are your views? What are your perceptions? What do you think? And again, how trustworthy and relevant is that information? That's the first, and it's a very important source. They're all important sources. The second is organisational data. <coughs> do organisational data reveal how much work from home is happening? Mm. Are there changes over time? Are there patterns in function? Can you see something in the data? Do organisational data importantly reveal anything about the effects of working from home? Can you say, look, here's a bit of the department, the organisation, that where people are working from home a lot, and we can actually see there's a problem here because you know something isn't happening that should be compared to this or other organisation. Did the organisation say tell you anything about why and if what kind of problem working from home might be? And if you do find that, then again, what about possible solutions? The organisational data might give you some clues about that, but again, how trustworthy and relevant is it? Scientific literature, what do we know about remote working, working from home? What does it suggest the problems? What are the effects of working from home? Do we know that if people work remotely, reduces, I know, creativity or collaboration? Is there lots of evidence? Is there no evidence? Is it good quality? Is it bad quality? What do we seem to know from that? Why do people choose to work from home? What do we know about that? What are the causes of that? And again, if we think there is a problem, do the same thing about looking at the scientific literature about the solution. But always, again, how trustworthy and relevant is it? Stakeholders. What do employees think about it? What do employee resource groups, customers, clients, uh, the government, senior management team, trade you, what do they think about this working from home thing? Do they think, oh, uh, I know, it's, it's a great thing, it's wonderful for our staff and we should protect it at all costs? Or do they think, actually, no, it will be better? What, what do they think? What do they believe? And again, if there's a problem, what about solutions? What do stakeholders think of, of might be viable solutions? And again, how trustworthy and relevant is it? Now, how do all those questions make you feel? How does this look? Can you imagine doing that? Yeah, exactly, and that's not just the wine. Quite tired. <laughs> quite tired. It is, it is, yes, it is quite tiring. Yeah, yeah, it is. What else? Overwhelming, tiring, yeah. Number three is particularly challenging. Scientific literature, yeah, yeah, yeah. it can be. Yeah, it can be. Get, getting hold of it, things are behind paywalls. It's often incomprehensible. There aren't many systematic reviews of the field. Yes, absolutely. This can be a problem. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's, it's a resource issue as well because if you think of the department of HR, whatever. Yeah. And right. Things which are commonly wide. Common <coughs> you've got to interact with lots of people, and you have to make sure that they do have time. Yeah. Energy. It is. Yeah, absolutely. It is a resource issue. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think there's also a balance in like how much information you get from each time you weight it in terms of how that's going to impact your funding, so the direction throughout that you take out of the evidence that you gather to. Yeah. Uh, you know, when do you get your statistical significance in terms of the amount you yeah. get through? Exactly, yeah. So it looks a bit boring and hard, doesn't it? Doesn't it? <coughs> I think it does. <laughs> um, but the question is, is it worth doing? That's the question. And, and usually when I'm talking to a particular HR practice and manager, I ask them these questions, how long do you think it would take? And back to your point about time, people say, oh, it take weeks, it would take months to do this. Uh, and then is it doable? They're kind of going, yeah, maybe not the science bit, or our actual organisational data, our, our databases, our management information systems are kind of useless, they're completely all over the place, it's really hard to pull out data. Yes, we can talk to stakeholders, yes, we can look at our own expertise, but other, these other sources of data could be quite problematic. So it's difficult. Is it worth it? And again, the answer is maybe if the problem is really important, which is fair enough. Of course you want to do it. It's really important for me that I get a good dinner, so I'm prepared to spend a bit of time on it. It may not be important for someone else. But then I share the good news. <coughs> and I think the good news is that spending any time doing this is better than spending no time. Even if you've got an afternoon, and that's all you've got, just one afternoon, uh, and the team's going to, each person in the team's going to devote two hours to it, I would say you're still more likely to identify if there is a problem with too much work at home, what you can do about it, than if you don't go through something like this process. So even an afternoon would help. Uh, looking at multiple sources is going to be better than looking at one source. Taking a structured approach is better than taking an unstructured approach. Using evidence with an awareness of its trustworthiness is better than no evidence, or not, or no awareness of its trustworthiness. So even if I'm in this hotel room or the day before I arrive in Madrid, even if I've only got 10 minutes to try and look at online, 
for restaurant reviews, I'm still more likely to get a good dinner if I spend a few minutes than zero minutes. That makes sense. Does that make sense? But there is something intrinsically, um, I don't know, what's the word? Dull about this? There really is. And I can't, well, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, about what we can maybe do about that. Okay. Please, please, please. So is there a risk? There is. <laughs> Sorry. Always. <laughs> if you do this in a relatively superficial way, it's going to give the stakeholders or the managers credibility for what you're proposing that doesn't have. Okay? Yeah. Jump on it and actually <clears throat> not be the right solution. Yeah. And I think that's why, as I've got to say, I think it has to be seen as part of a, a longer term, ongoing organisational development, OD sort of thing. You're right, if it's just done as a one-off, and so people go, yeah, we're right, because we asked some stakeholders, we found a paper online, we're right, that's obviously completely the wrong approach to it. Uh, I think the, the less risky approach is to say, we've got this much time, we've found this evidence, this is what it is, this is what we think about it, and we're going to make this decision for these reasons. Maybe, it's ter- maybe the outcome will be terrible, but we, at least we know why we made it and on what basis. But, that's not, but we're going to make decisions again and again and again and again and again. So that's kind of the idea. But you're right, it is a risk if you just use it to get what you want or to say, you know, we're right, absolutely. Yeah? How do you guard against sort of preconceptions at the outset? I mean, presumably if Jane Newbury's mob did a study of work from home. Well, he did. <laughs> well, I understand. He actually did a randomised control trial, I understand. He got little memos. <laughs> put them in some office. No, he could have done it, couldn't you? Uh, yeah, so... Yes, we all have huge pre-existing biases, of course, absolutely. There's things we like, there's things we don't like, there's ideas we like, there's data we like, there's fine, you know, we're full of it. So the key thing is, when we're looking at, uh, it's very hard for us to see our own biases, but it's, it's relatively easy to spot other people. So I could say to you, why do you keep saying that? Why do you keep thinking that? Why do you keep thinking this won't work? What's that based on? And it can actually start to ask you and interrogate you, as it were, about why you think that. So that's why the other thing, it's often not emphasised enough, is, is it's really important to do this as a group or a team. It's not a thing an individual practitioner can do, partly for, exactly for that reason, because we're terrible at spotting our own biases, but we're not bad at spotting other people's. Yeah. But we're full, yeah. And we should assume, going into this process, that we have those biases. We should, that should be our base, and we're full of biases, of course, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, um, the, doing it this way allows you to get to the root cause, often. But there does seem a tendency, certainly with organisations I work with and what I see, that everyone seems to be quite happy with sticking blasters. So yeah. I, I guess how can we overcome that? Maybe that's what you're going to come up to. I am, but I think you're right. I think the, the idea that you spend time, more time trying to understand the nature of the problem opportunity before you act is, okay, in my, this is experiential evidence, by the way. Uh, of not great quality, by the way, but uh, it seems to me that is one of the major, major obstacles, that people are happy to not spend too much time thinking about that. I mean, example I always use it, if we're doing training with, uh, say, a, a management team or an HR team, we say, this morning, we're going to focus on understanding the problem and all the problems you're facing, and this afternoon, we're going to talk about solutions. Guess what happens after about 10 minutes? On to solutions. Come on, solutions. And I think part of the reason is because doing stuff and having an implemented solution is just easier. <coughs> Cognitively, it's more fun. I think if you're discussing what the nature of the problem is, it causes a lot of interpersonal conflict, potentially. You've got the issue of biases. But if you say, let's just agree on this thing, let's just do it, and then we'll all kind of get along and it'll be nice. I think that's the big thing. Yeah. So definitely when you speak, and those kind of four, yeah. so you said it sounds boring, to me, it sounds like an innovation process, just to get through. You just like mix the steps up, right? Yeah. Which everybody goes, oh my god, we love innovation, we might get involved in innovation. So it's, maybe it's quite branding. <laughs> yeah, it could, okay, it could be branding. The term evidence based practice is pretty horrible, I think. And even in medicine, not long after they introduced the term, they were discussing we need to change this because it sounds horrible. So there could be a bit of a branding thing there. Yeah, I think it's possibly too late now, but there might be a, there really might be an issue there. It just sounds odd, yeah. I think it's being rebranded now. Okay. In some of the business schools, as inquiry-driven leadership. Okay. Which is teaching leaders to do exactly not what you're saying, is to 
kind of take a bit of a problem, assume it's a problem, and then run off. It's to actually get them to slow down. Yes. And actually say yeah. exactly what is the problem. Yeah. The data for that. Out of all these challenges, what's the most important part? <coughs> Which is kind of a light version of what we talked about. So yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. And I think whether it's a sort of innovative process or, or that kind of approach, I think obviously this is pretty similar to many, many, many approaches that are around decision making because it doesn't come from, it didn't come from God, it didn't come from outer space. It came from people doing stuff like choosing a restaurant. It came from basic principles, multiple sources, slowing down, identify a problem first, critical thinking, uh, understand the quality of the evidence and information. So it's not surprising. I think it's fine, overlaps of the stuff as well, but you're right, I think you're right, yeah. Um, what you've already been saying, Rob, isn't part of the problem that we look to our specialists in organisations to give us a solution yeah. like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what we need to do is to re-educate people so that they, you know, they are experts, but they can't necessarily come well, up with something. We do, we do look to specialists, and also I think in the context of HR specifically, I think to me, my limited understanding of like the business partner model, the Ulrich thing, is that what it meant, my sense of what, one of the things it seemed to mean to some HR professionals is that you sort of, you do what you're asked to do, you provide very quick answers, you don't challenge much. A uh, senior management team says, oh, we all <coughs> want training on MBTI, please. And you go, sure, fine, we can do that. I mean, that sense of, being an expert is delivering something without saying, well, what actually is the problem, what is the issue? Because that's quite uncomfortable. And particularly with HR, who I think still often feel they have to justify themselves yeah. in organisations, yeah. it's easier to say, yes, I can do yes, that. Yes, it is, say, yeah. Give me a half a day to yeah. explore that. Yeah, yes, absolutely, that's right. Yeah. Any other questions, thoughts? Okay, so how much evidence based practice is going on? So I'm sure you've all got loads of stories from your own experience of being in meetings and talking to clients and colleagues, you all go through those four areas and the six steps, I'm sure you haven't got any examples like that. Uh, but what are some indicators? Imagine, give me some popular ideas. What about, we mentioned agile, blockchain. What are popular business and management ideas? Uh, quality, improvement. quality improvement, TQM. Say again. Growth mindset, yeah. <laughs> Great idea. Yeah, good, very good. Growth mindset. So take any of those things. What if you say is this popular growth mindset or agile? Is it popular? How do you judge? Well, these are ways to think you judge. Firstly, in terms of the media, you'd expect to see articles, features, ma management books, YouTube videos, posts on LinkedIn, TED Talks. This is all the kind of thing you expect to see. In the context of evidence-based practice in management, just is there much? Not really. Not much at all. Practitioners and organisations, expect managers will be discussing this at conferences, or organisational leaders will be championing it, or organisations will be adopting these principles and recruiting and rewarding managers. You could meet a practitioner at a party, you could tell you what it was, which certainly can be a growth mindset. It's fascinating. Um, or widely shared public examples. But again, evidence based practice, not much. Yeah? So I agree that the concept isn't popular, but analytics is very popular, being data driven is very popular. So this rhetoric yeah. of making management decisions based on there is. data. That's yeah, oh, absolutely. And you could certainly find loads of posts on analytics. Yeah, loads. And data analytics is the solution. Right, but, you, but the problem with that is that it's only one source. Yeah, absolutely. The whole point, yeah, absolutely. So you can also find articles about using science, but that's irrelevant. Analytics is irrelevant. The point about evidence based practice is about bringing all these things together. It's one of the core components of it. So, yeah. You're right, bits of it people do talk about for sure. Yeah, thank you. You might have support out to training programs, consultants is offering advice, uh, lots of systematic reviews. Uh, you might have university courses. There are more university courses now in evidence based management. There are, it's true. So there's a little bit of that, but not, not much kind of commercial stuff. Professional bodies, you might see the specific adoption of it. You might see requirements to undertake these courses. Uh, you might see CPD aligned to evidence based practice principles. And again, you just don't see much of it. So, in my sense, it isn't popular. It is not popular. People aren't a little bit, maybe here, maybe some of you, but it's not a thing that people are really particularly doing. But I mean, no one's doing it. I mean, it's not popular. What do I think we've got wrong? And by we, I mean mostly me, 
but it's not just me. <laughs> but I don't mean, I don't mean, what I mean is I can't, I'm, not ble- I'm not saying other people got this. I'm saying it's my view about what we, everyone interested in promoting this, some of us have done. So I'm not, there's been lots of people, not lots, there's been a few people involved in it. <laughs> not lots. I'm going from one to the other, me or lots. And it's just a, there's been a small, relatively small group. So these are the 18 problems. So if you thought the other bit was boring, wait till you get through these. Right. <laughs> Firstly, focusing way too much on the science. Way too much on the science. Uh, it's important, but it's just one source of evidence. And it doesn't seem to change behaviour. Those of you who have, have tried to say, oh, here's a, here's a load of evidence about something, what do you think? People just go, nah, don't like it. You got any other evidence? You know? So, yeah. Not acknowledging that universe and academics are, in general, not a bird, but, but in general, part of the problem, not part of the solution. Universities like it don't really help with this for all kinds of reasons. Framing it, this evidence-based fact, part of this, what I call a tedious and misplaced practitioner-academic divide or gap. It's nothing to do with the divide or gap. Why do people think the solution is to get academics and practice to work together? It's nothing to do with that. This evidence-based practice is about practice. It's about what managers and practitioners and HR people, are, what they're doing in their work. They don't want an academic, you know, next, sitting next to them nudging them, giving them suggestions. It's not really the point. It's not the point. Implying that scientists are somehow better or purer practitioners compared to managers when they're not. Lots of, in terms of research, lots of questionable research practice, unethical behaviour, uh, you know, the, the whole kind of replication crisis. You know, so we're not necessarily better practice in any sense. Making evidence based practice sound like a technocratic solution which can only be undertaken by experts, nerds, wonks, brainiacs, elites, and so on. So it sounds like when you see that, you say, oh, we can't do that. That's for, re- that's for someone else. It's an expert. Maybe back to your point. Yes, it's not for us. It's for someone else. Being too myth-bustery, which tends to alienate rather than engage. It is really crucial to challenge, but it needs to be much more sophisticated. It's quite difficult to do. So if you take something like growth mindset, if you want to try and challenge it, it's pretty difficult because people love it. Uh, and there's not much you can do about that. But you know, how do you then start to challenge and say, well, maybe it's not quite what you think it is? We don't sufficiently appreciate how the work context pulls practitioners away from evidence-based practice. In other words, we don't appreciate their constraints and incentives. I'll talk about that more later. I think you mentioned it before about sticking plaster. Also, I think somewhere in this, we're implying that practitioners are making mistakes or are silly or odd or not thinking straight. You know, oh, those silly practitioners with their silly ideas in their fads, aren't they silly and funny? We need to help them. You know, there's a bit of that to it, I think. Not being sufficiently clear about when an evidence-based practice approach makes more or less sense. So clearly you shouldn't do this for everything, but what are, what are the things you should do it for? Not engaging effectively with a reasonable objection we've already heard today. It takes too much time. And often I think we just shrug and go, yeah, it does take a long time. People go, but it takes too much time. Yeah, it takes a long time. That's not a response. That is not a response to that objection, really. Insufficient focus on the diagnosis part of evidence-based practice. Too much focus on using evidence-based practice to find a solution. And this is why I don't like this kind of what works approach. Because the what works approach makes the assumption that the the problem is extremely clearly and well-defined and in every organisation or every context or every person or every community, it's the same thing. Yeah, you can talk about what works then, but it has to be more or less exactly the same issue or problem in exactly the same context. So what works is not a terribly helpful way of thinking about it, because it also makes people think quickly about a solution rather than understanding what the issue might be. Only six more to go. Uh, <laughs> positioning evidence-based practice is something individuals or teams can do, and it requires structural and systemic thinking and action. You can't expect an individual, even a couple of people in a big honor to do this. They will not be very popular. It will be very difficult for them to do it. So it's not about encouraging individuals to do it. It's about thinking about almost like an organizational change thing, I think. Not emphasizing that the quality of decision making is about the process, not the outcome. People often judge how good their decision making is by the outcome. But it's nothing to do, the outcome is a completely different thing. The process is important. So it's like me choosing a restaurant. If I go through that process, I'm more likely to get a good dinner. Maybe I don't get a good dinner. But it doesn't mean my process was wrong. It doesn't mean it was a poor decision. It just means I didn't get a good dinner. So to separate those things out is really important. It's a bit like people saying that experiment is good because it got the result the researchers wanted. This is a good experiment. I proved my hypothesis. No. 
whether something's a good experiment or not depends on how you design it and all those other kinds of things not to do with the result you get. Phase 15, phase to clarify evidence based practice is not a one off thing, but needs to be a longer term process of individual, group, and organisational learning development. Not starting from where practitioners are now <coughs> and what they can realistically do now. I think my feeling is from trying to teach and train is it feels too, too distant from people. It's too remote. It's not something they feel they can do. So they go, thanks very much, but I'm all right, you know, I'm okay. Positioning evidence based practice is about making really, really well informed decisions rather than saying it's about making better informed decisions. The goal is too high, I think, sometimes. And also, we tend to focus on the teeny tiny, incy wincy proportion of practitioners who want to and are able to try evidence-based practice. Evidence-based practice is not for everyone, but it's also not for almost no one. So we tend to focus on a tiny group of people who feel they can do it. And I don't, you know, that's fine, but it doesn't really help more people. So that's what I think is something that's done wrong. So what about the context of managers and the way they work? And again, be interested in your views about this. What are we mostly rewarded for doing at work? And this is a generalisation, okay? We're rewarded for doing stuff. Stuff. And helping others to do stuff. Lots of stuff. Lots and lots of stuff. Doing the stuff fast. That's really good. Did you do the stuff? Yeah, did you do it fast? Great. That's really great. <laughs> good, fast, lots of stuff. As long as the outcome isn't disastrous, you can do your stuff. Though, interestingly, again, Jeff talked to me about apparently in contemporary politics, politics now you can do stuff that's disastrous, and apparently it's all right. <laughs> apparently it helps, you know, helps your popularity, which is kind of a weird turn up. But yeah, so basically, people do stuff. As long as nothing goes terribly wrong, well done everyone, they did the stuff. But some of the stuff may be linked to important organisational outcomes, and some may not be. If you think about your job, think about my job, Think of a lot of the time I spend doing stuff. If I said, is this really making a difference? Is it helping the organisation? It's really hard to know. It's really hard to know because I haven't been, that task not been designed to do that necessarily. Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. But typically the stuff is not seriously evaluated, check if it works or not. Some of the contents of the stuff may be decided on the basis of critical thinking and the best available, but mostly probably not. A lot of the stuff is about what stuff are other organisations doing? We should do that stuff too. <laughs> Yeah, and then if we do that stuff, we'll be as good as those. Yeah, let's do some of that stuff, okay? In contexts where performance is difficult to assess, particularly like sort of knowledge work and other kinds of work, rewards are likely to be allocated in other ways. How skilled are you convincing others you're performing well? Can you convince other people you're doing a really good job? Because that, that is pretty good skill in itself, to be able to do that. And that's what's incentivized, as well as the stuff, doing the stuff. So I think this context is really important because it shapes the way people react to this. So... The principles are say understood, they're not, they're not weird, but they're seen as not particularly relevant. So again, I've had lots of conversations with, with managers who say, look, I get this, but sorry, it's just not, maybe, you know, maybe sometimes it would help a bit, but it's not really the way I work. It's not what I, we do. It's not, you know, we do stuff. We don't really, you know, it might help. Managers also, and this is a real killer for me, managers probably feel that decision making is generally pretty good. And maybe it is. Maybe it is. So why bother trying to improve it? We're saying that you can make better decisions, but supposing most people think, yeah, I'm pretty good at making decisions. Most people do. So why would they be interested in this? They probably wouldn't. Also, evidence-based practice will not be seen as not just irrelevant, but also harmful. It slows things down. So I think you would say it slows things down. Uh, you can't do the stuff as fast. It raises questions about the purpose of activities. Why are we doing this? What's it for? You can't do as much of the stuff. It reduces decision-making autonomy. A manager can't just do what they want because they're going to have to go and go through a process to see if it makes sense about what they want to do. It can open up decision-makers to unwelcome and unfamiliar scrutiny. The, the idea that someone's going to examine you know, the way they're making decisions, that's you know, not very nice, I guess, for some people. And also, I think, so I've also detected a fear that evidence-based practice may raise the ghosts of decisions past. The people like do a post mortem on things and go, why the fuck did we do that? You know, which is quite uncomfortable if you've already kind of done it, spent the money, the budget's allocated to go back and look at that again. So I think this context really shapes the reaction. So finally, learning from our mistakes. What can we do differently to promote evidence based practice? So just a few suggestions. Firstly, I think it's focusing on the principles of evidence based practice. Multiple sources, assessing trustworthy, taking a structured approach. I think we can kind of simplify it and make it a bit less sort of scary and boring sounding, rather than using any particular model. 
Secondly, I think we can emphasise the need to start with using evidence to understand the problem opportunity first, and only when we're reasonably clear about that, thinking about a solution or intervention. Often people say in that you know, podcast, you know, what's the one thing you would say to people they can do to be more evidence-based? And that's the one thing. If you only want to do one thing, spend more time thinking about and understanding what the situation, problem, or opportunity is. Don't look for solutions. Spend much more time doing that, even if it's uncomfortable and harder. More focus on better informed decisions, not great decisions, not great, but just better informed, incremental improvements, marginal gains, and develop frameworks for facilitating and implementing that. How can someone who doesn't want to go the whole evidence-based practice, how can they make a bit of a better decision? How can we support them in doing that? Also framing evidence-based practice is also about capitalising opportunities, not just fixing problems. A lot of stuff in management and nature is about there is a problem we need to fix, or what about opportunities? You can take the same kind of approach to that. Develop and articulate the ethical and sustainability benefits of evidence-based practice, not just the effectiveness angle. So I haven't talked about it much today, but of course you could argue, and you've all probably got to experience, an incredible waste that goes on organisations. Budgets are spent, things are implemented, stuff is rolled out, and it probably doesn't do anything. And it just wastes time, it wastes money, it wastes other kinds of resources. So it's a sustainability thing, but also an ethical thing, and making decisions in a more explicit and open way, and consulting stakeholders. Starting where practitioners and organisations are now. So I think we need more of a segmentation of the market of potential adopters. So my cookbook analogy is we're presenting a Thomas Keller per se, the French laundry cookbook to manage it. Here you go. And what they want is like James' 15 minute meal. <laughs> Nothing wrong with James' 15 minute meal, but you know, at least they'll get a better meal if they actually follow that. They're not, they don't want Thomas Keller's incredibly complicated sous vide jus reduction thing. You just want to have slightly better food. Simply producing more and more systematic reviews of scientific evidence is not in itself useful. So having access is, is, is important, but in itself it's not useful. How can we develop ways of helping practitioners to use them in their work, along with other sources of evidence? And find, I think, understand and engaging with, rather than ignore, practitioners' contextual barriers to using EBP. I've personally been quite guilty of this, the practice say to me, oh, we can't do that. It just, it's just too hard, we haven't got time. And I go, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> yeah, I don't really engage with it. I just go, oh, well, you know, I'll go find a practitioner who can then. I'm still looking, but, you know, I'll go find some <laughs> practitioner who can do that. So I think we tend to ignore that. OK, I'm going to stop in a second. So, once upon a future time, so rather than going 24 years back, let's go 24 years into the future. And it's not a very happy thought of the moment, is it? But, <laughs> actually, that was a really bad way to, I didn't think about that. Okay, 24 years in the future. Uh, and in the 24 years, absolutely nobody is talking about evidence-based practice anymore. No one even uses that term. So there's two possibilities. There's more. There's two main possibilities. Number one is, it just was a passing fad. Everyone thought, evidence-based practice, absolute rubbish, forget about it. Ugh. The other possibility, which is the one I'd like to believe, is it becomes so commonplace to think about multiple sources of evidence, going through some sort of structure, uh, you know, think about the quality of data and information. It's so commonplace that people don't even talk, discuss it. They just kind of do it. That's what I would like to think. Maybe in 24 hours might happen. Because after all, evidence-based practice is just about getting a good dinner. It's not about doing anything massively clever. Thank you. <laughs>